Welcome to the Philip Street Church of Christ Sermon Series. This is part two of a series of lessons that Brother Andy Brewer is bringing entitled, Who We Are, Our Heritage. This morning we began a study that I believe is of the utmost importance, not just because of the day and age in which we live, although that obviously is a consideration. This is something we need to talk about more regularly regardless of what is occurring in the world around us. We live in a day and age where the values that have molded who we are supposed to be as a people in this nation have come under serious attack. And we began this morning by looking at Psalm 33 and verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And how we need to remember that there is a biblical principle for remembering the foundations that have been laid within a nation. The nation of Israel was established according to godly principles. When they remembered that, they were successful and blessed, but when they forgot, they were punished severely. Now, this nation is not like the nation of Israel in many different ways, some of which we mentioned this morning. We are not the chosen people of God. God has not chosen us to the exclusion of all other nations in the world like Israel. That just simply is not a parallel. We are not the nation through whom the Messiah is going to come. The Messiah has already come. And there is not a parallel along those lines. But there is a similarity in this standpoint. We discussed this morning how the nation of Israel had, had its founding rooted in God's Word and in His law and according to His principles. And this nation is similar to Israel in that sense. Our founders and our leaders for generations believed that for a nation to truly be blessed and to succeed in principle, it needed to be founded on godly principles. And we looked at, for instance, an example of that, 2 Kings 21, with the nation of Israel. And when our time expired this morning, we had moved into, look, into looking at some evidences of the fact that our nation was founded according to Christian principles. Now, you will not hear that from many outlets in our society today. In fact, we're trying to be convinced just to the contrary. That there is no root of Christianity in this nation. There was never any dependency on the Bible. And never was it intended for this nation to be a Christian nation. Oh, but to the contrary. When we parted ways this morning, we had begun to look at some of these evidences. The first of which was the first inaugural address of our first president, George Washington who in his speech alluded to the Almighty Being, who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of nations, whose providential aids can supply every human defect. He referred to the benediction of God, to the charge of God, and to God as the great author and the invisible hand, spoken April 11, 17. 89. Does it appear as though President Washington was trying to skirt around the concept that he was now the president of a nation that was intended to be uniquely Christian, serving Jehovah God and being guided and governed according to his principles? The, uh, this, though, by no means, I should say, represents the earliest injection of Christianity into the founding principles of our nation. 1789, as far as our history is concerned, is fairly late in the game. Let's go even earlier. Fifteen years earlier, in fact, we find in 1774, the short-lived First Continental Congress meeting from September the 5th until October the 26th, 1774, and one of its first orders of business was to pass a resolution that every single session in which they met was to be open, opened with a prayer. A resolution which continued in both the Second Continental Congress as well as something called the Confederation 
Congress leading up to the inauguration of President Washington in 1789. And in my research, I find that it was distinctly a Christian prayer. It was not an all-inclusive prayer in which you could use generic language in which any religious person of any religion in all the world would feel comfortable in hearing. No, it alluded to the God of the Bible. It's interesting, though, that not only were these men distinctly religious, but they interjected religion into their proceedings and into their public policy. In fact, with the same group of men, 15 times over an eight-year period, just before the Revolutionary War, through the time period of the Revolutionary War, and then just after the Revolutionary War, 15 times over an eight-year period, we have the Congress issuing proclamations, public proclamations from the highest tiers of government, calling on the nation to fast, pray, and give thanks to the God of heaven in view of their present struggle. Can you imagine? Congress calling upon men to pray. But that's exactly what they did. Also on September 11, 1777, the founders issued an order for Congress to front the money for the printing of 20,000 Bibles to be distributed among the people, which cost was to be reimbursed by their sale. Imagine our government not only issuing a proclamation saying we want the Bible in the hands of our citizens, but in addition to that, we are going to put up the money to make sure that they are printed or at least shipped in so that they can have access to that information. And yet we're not, and we're never intended to be a Christian nation. Additionally, we can look to various other sources from early in our nation's history that all are going to point to the same undeniable fact. Christianity was at our roots. In fact, look at some of our founding documents. They themselves use explicit language in referring to such as the Declaration of Independence. Referring to nature's God who created all men equal and are then endowed by their Creator who is the supreme judge of the world and protects man by His divine providence. Oh, but there was never any intention for us to be uniquely a Christian nation. Also think about the U.S. Constitution and the number of references it makes to God, but not only that. In the U.S. Constitution, there is special consideration given toward federal business being done on any day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, Thursday, Friday or Saturday, to the exclusion of any federal business being done on Sunday. Oh, but there can't be a religious connection there, could there? Moving on, we look at perhaps on the state level. Of the 50 states that now comprise our country, 46 of those states have constitutions that begin with a preamble. Of those 46 state constitutions that begin with a preamble, 45 of them begin with an appeal, an explicit and passionate appeal to the God of the Bible. Moving on, every single president of the United States in their inaugural address from Washington onward have, number one, alluded to God in that speech. And unashamedly so. But not only that, not only has every single president of this nation alluded to the God of the Bible 
in his inaugural address, but interestingly, they have also taken the oath of office with their hands on that Bible. And from Washington to Fillmore, a tradition that was kept from every president in between was that after they took the oath of office, they leaned down to the Bible on which their hand had been placed and they kissed it. But there was never any intention for this nation to be uniquely Christian. Our national songs, just about every one of them, if not all of them, allude and invoke the name of God in their words. Here you have the Star Spangled Banner, but there are many, many more songs that we view as national songs. Each of them likewise invoke the name of God. Our currency bears the national motto, even though there have been some efforts to revoke this. In God we trust. As a nation, we have national symbols, most if not all of which refer to God. Two of which are the Liberty Bell and the Statue of Liberty. And each of them have inscribed upon them a verse from the Bible. Leviticus 25 and verse 10. But we were never intended to be uniquely a Christian nation. In our national architecture, we find religious expressions scattered throughout them all. From the Supreme Court to the Library of Congress to the U.S. Capitol to the White House itself. But we weren't intended to be a Christian nation. Our national memorials, monuments, mostly all markedly have religious expressions of Jehovah God inscribed upon them. I'll never forget a few years ago, 2008, Christy and I went to Washington, D.C. on vacation and I'll never forget standing in the Jefferson Memorial, in the, uh, in the Lincoln Memorial, and seeing portions of some of their speeches inscribed on the walls, and, and reading with my own eyes explicit language referring to God. And I remember standing there shaking my head thinking, and yet we are not intended to be a Christian nation. Perhaps one of the most telling and interesting to me, not necessarily with regard to government itself, but in doing some reading the last week, I came across quite a bit of information with regard to textbooks that were used back in the founding days of our country. And in textbooks like you see on the screen, the New England Primer, the original Blueback Speller, if you were to go through and read some of the excerpts from those textbooks, you would find that those men and women who wrote those books used Bible verses and biblically, biblically moral teachings in order to provide other lessons, spelling, uh, vocabulary, uh, things of that nature. They weren't ashamed to refer to the Bible to get their point across as so many are today. And I assure you that through my reading just in the last few days that there are many, many more examples that could be cited, all of which historically are going to port our minds to the reality that when this nation was founded, its founders had the intention that this was going to be a country that would be governed and directed according to the principles that we read about in this book. And that they were not going to be ashamed to promote the principles that are founded in this book. Were they willing to tolerate other religions to a degree? Yes. You see, the founders had come from a nation under a tyrannical leader who had essentially told them this is the way you will worship or you will be punished. And they wanted to get away from that. 
And in establishing this nation, they did not want to establish a nation where there was such, an, uh, such a tyrannical form of government in place again. And so, yes, they were tolerant of other religions, but at the same time, they saw one that was worthy of promotion, and that was Christianity. To deny that the Christian religion and the teachings of the Bible did not have a marked influence on the founding principles of our country, and that the Christian religion was not only tolerated but promoted by our government is a lie. And I don't mind saying it because it's the truth. What we're hearing today with regard to our, the, the, the attempts of many to rewrite our history, to prove with facts that our nation has no historical roots, in Christianity are all lies. And I'm not just saying that because, I, that because I want it to be true. I'm saying it because every shred of evidence that we have from our own documents, architecture, currency, traditions, etc. points to that essential fact. And it's interesting to me that when you point out all of that evidence... The mouths of the dissenters quickly shut because they do not have a foundation on which they can stand. That's the evidence, folks. The evidence of our heritage in answering the question, who are we? We as a people live in a country that was intended to be uniquely Christian. And if we ever get to be where we're ashamed of that, then may God have mercy on our souls. And that's just about all that we can say. Now, with all of that in mind, to conclude this first installment of our study, I, I want to look back at all that we've discussed this morning and tonight thus far and, and use all of that to provide an encouragement an encouragement for us to remember. You remember that as a people, every human being's purpose, I believe, falls under Solomon's blanket statement of Ecclesiastes 12, 13. When he said, the conclusion of the whole matter is this, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. There is not a single person who has ever lived or ever shall live whose personal responsibility is not outlined by those words. But let's take that even a step further. It's not just the case that Ecclesiastes 12, 13 outlines our individual responsibilities. It's true, it does. But let me ask you this. If Ecclesiastes 12, 13 outlines my individual responsibility and it outlines your individual responsibility, when you take us collectively together, what then does our responsibility become? Well, it certainly doesn't change. My responsibility is to fear God and keep His commandment, and your responsibility is to fear God and keep His commandment. Then our responsibility together as a collective group of people then becomes to fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole of man individually as well as universally. And just as every individual must fear God and keep His commandments, so then must every nation. Turn to Psalm 72. We're going to look at a couple of verses from there, and then I want to look at one from Psalm 86. In Psalm 72 and verse 11, we find David saying, Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Does this sound as though God had an expectation for the kingdoms of men? To not rule in and of themselves, of their own purpose and of their own will. What it does seem to indicate is that God had a universal expectation applicable to every nation under heaven. That all kings would fall down 
before him and all nations then would serve him. Now let me ask you this. What nation under heaven throughout all history does that negate? Does it negate Israel? Well, certainly not because Israel was God's people. Well, well okay, what about, what about Babylon then? Babylon wasn't God's own people. Aren't they excluded from that? No. What about Egypt? No. Edom? No. What about the Amalekites? No. What about the Gibeonites? No. What about the Philistines? No. You see, when David says all kings and all nations shall fall before him and serve him, that is pretty well inclusive of everyone, isn't it? Every king that has ever lived and ever shall live, every nation that has ever existed and ever shall exist. We all have the same expectation. Serve God. And historically, what has happened when a nation, to put it in our terms, got a little bit too big for its own britches? Well, God had to teach them a lesson. Let me tell you, folks. This country is not too big to fail. I love this country, and I will do anything I possibly can to make sure that doesn't happen. But realistically speaking, there's nothing about this nation that makes us any different than Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Power, most powerful nations in the world in their day, what happened to every one of them, they fell. Why? Because they refused to serve God. They got too big for their own britches. And they had to be reminded of who they really were. Who are we? Well, if we will realize that we are simply servants of the Most High God, we'll be just fine. But the moment we begin to forget that on a mass level, is when we get into a lot of trouble. And we're well on our way there. Secondly, Psalm 72, verse 17. His name, the name of God, shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. Men shall be blessed in Him. All nations shall call Him blessed. Question number two. What nation is excluded from that? What nation that has ever existed or ever shall exist is excluded from the need to call the God of heaven blessed, to submit themselves under His will and be directed according to His charge? Not a single one, including the United States of America. We need to learn our place. We need to learn who we are and who we are supposed to be. If not, we have... Some troubled times ahead of us. And then Psalm 86 and verse 9. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Question number three, what nations are excluded from that? He said all nations whom thou hast made. Well, there's the clarifying statement. All we have to do is think about what nations God has not made. Well, well there aren't any, are there? Isn't God the creator of all, all things, all people, and all nations? And so when David gives that clarifying statement, it really isn't a clarifying, clarifying statement at all. It's just further indicative of the power and the authority that God is supposed to have over us. And yet we keep slapping Him in the face and spitting upon Him. Day after day after day. Folks, it comes down to this. Our meaning in life is to serve God and to render praise to Him. And that right is now being threatened in a very serious way. And I'm asked on a regular basis, what are we going to do about it? Well, the first thing we have to do about it is return to our roots by remembering our heritage. In his second inaugural address, President Thomas Jefferson stated, His sole intention 
as president and the hopeful direction of the nation under his leadership with these words. I shall need to the favor of that being in whose hands we are who led our fathers as Israel of old from their native land and planted them in a country flowing with all the necessities and comforts of life, who has covered our infancy with His providence and our riper years with His wisdom and power, and to whose goodness I ask you to join in supplications with me that He will enlighten the minds of your servants." that He will guide their counsels, that He will prosper their measures, that whatsoever they shall do in your good and shall secure to you the peace, friendship, and approbation of all nations. Ten times in a very, very short paragraph, you see Him invoking the name of God and appealing to Him for direction. Friends, seeing the words of yet another president, one that is typically viewed as one of the least religious of all. Let me ask this question. Is there really, I mean honestly, without all the prejudice and bigotry and everything that, that's currently fueling this debate right now, Let's just strip it all the way, boil it down to its most basic element and ask this question. Is there really any question among the sincere hearts of this nation as to where our roots lie? There shouldn't be because the evidence is clear. Our heritage is with God. And in order to restore ourselves to what we used to be, we need to remember who we are. It's going to take resolution. It's going to take commitment. The same type of commitment that it requires in our lives individual to, individually to live lives that are pleasing to God. And friends, that's really where it all begins. I can do nothing for no one around me, my nation included. If I myself have not put full devotion toward my soul, toward my life and what I am being directed by and how in the world I am being governed. How can I expect the people of this nation to submit their lives to God in a mass effort if I myself am unwilling? So that's where it all begins. Have I made the personal conscious decision that I am going to be one of God's own children? that I'm going to allow my life to be directed by His principles and His precepts? If not, I need to seriously consider the direction that I'm allowing my life to be led before I give much thought and concern to the direction this nation is being led. Friends, if you're not a child of God tonight, we plead with you to earnestly consider the direction you are heading. And decide to not, to put all of that behind you and simply become a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And with that faith, are you willing to repent of your sins, confess your faith and be immersed in water to have your sins washed away? By doing that, you can become a child of God, be redeemed by His blood, be added to His church, and live with the blessed assurance that there is a far, far better life that is awaiting once this one comes to an end. Maybe you've done that in the past, but your life has been anything but what it should have been. It hasn't been lived according to His principles. It hasn't been rooted in His truth. And it certainly hasn't been lived according to His law. Why not make the decision to not come back and, and restore yourself in the same way that you would love to see this nation restored, repent of your sins, confess them, pray to God for forgiveness, and He will forgive you. Cleanse you of your unrighteousness. Remember your sins and your iniquities no more. 
That's the offer that God has available to you tonight, and we plead with you to accept it in your obedience while together we stand and sing.